Welcome back to the Nutramedical Report. We have the top guests in the world with a consistent message that brings you better questions and better answers and analysis. Professor James McCanny, of course, is the developer of the Plasma Universe Theory, Electric Universe Theory, and explains one of the most dangerous objects in near space in the solar system are comets. And they are not just dirty snowballs, which is the old theory, which is still promoted by Tier 2 science. Tier 1 science and the globalist governments are fully aware, which is why they're spinning it. They're sending us double messages. They're going to have a ISON observation team with NASA. On the other hand, they're trying to downplay it and not make anybody concerned about the fact that ISON comets can trigger off major superstorms in the sun. And then we have the fear-mongering by the outgoing DHS director, Napolitano, telling us everything is fine when in actual fact there's extreme danger that they have not hardened the power grid. They're fear-mongering us, but they're not hardening the power grid. They're not telling what people can do personally to protect their electronics and their personal life. They're not getting ready with citizen activation, or if you want to call it uh, teams ready with the county sheriff, etc., to develop the idea that if we have a power blackout from either a, a solar coronal mass ejection like the 1859 Carrington event, <clears throat> or an attack by a nation such as Iran after we, quote, attack them, because if we attack Syria, Iran is next, which you can be certain Syria and Iran will use EMP weapons or China and Russia against our population. In fact, the very first weapons you know, these countries will use against us isn't nuclear or biological, it's EMP. It's the prescient war system or weapon of the 21st century. So to hear our... Um, Former director of CIA put out false information that we just missed a CME that knocked out, would could have knocked out our power grid. To see Napolitano say 100% chance of this happening, it's shocking in an outgoing the head of a major division of the government. To hear these kind of things, when you think, what are they trying to prove here? They're sending us double messages. They're trying to scare people. They're not doing any preparation to either make the system hardened against the collapse. And yet, on the other hand, they're telling us they're going to do a drill of NERC on November 13th and 14th when Professor McCanny has stated clearly months before where his information is being abused and misused by these maniacs, including not only ones he knows as disinfo ops, but people in other countries that are unknown. Someone supposedly a, quote, source from Russia recently yesterday trying to spin it that we're going to have a collapse of civilization potentially after these dates. I find it very aggravating when they're forthcoming on Tier 1 science information and they try to, to not show respect for Professor McCanny or his theories or prove that they are or are not true, and on the other hand, try to scare the public with no public preparation by the government. This is an obscenity. It shows the example of the globalists trying to hide Tier 1 science in every sphere from astrophysics to medicine to any other area, including tokamak fusion reactors, which I know about are real for 60 years. And the fact is, we have a, a satanic global government they could give a rat's behind for the population of Earth. So, um, Professor McKenney, uh, I don't know about your rage index over this, but each day I get madder and madder that <clears throat> we have a, a puppet government in the White House. We have scientists who are saying things that are scary. In fact, even Mishu Kaku was on Coast to Coast Radio. I didn't see the, listen to the program, but he was on talking about gamma ray bursts and other things from deep space <clears throat> and some broad statements there, but I want you to kind of clarify all of this stuff, because this is way out of control, and obviously all the signs tell us this is a 9-11 type false flag event. They were going to do a NERC trial, United States, Canada, and Mexico. This has what I call passes a smell test for bad stuff is coming, and the government's planning on doing something horrific to the population. Yeah, Dr. Bill, uh, first of all, the amount of misinformation on YouTube, on the Internet, on oh, all kinds of web pages uh, using my name. And then I just saw one here. I mean, there's hundreds and hundreds of these. I just saw one where I did talk about what I called the red hand of death is an ancient phenomena where sulfur dioxide comes into the atmosphere and those, those comets that are big enough to reach out near Jupiter uh, are pulling in sulfur dioxide. So when it, uh, we interact with these and it, they're close enough and it comes into the atmosphere, it appears red and it can poison the water. So somebody is saying that I said Comet Ison is going to do this. Um, and uh, and 
crash into Earth and it's Planet X and it's no, there's no evidence of that at all. Well, we know that when we pass through the tail of Halley's uh, Halley's comet, that it contains cyanide, and that's been known for many centuries that it causes the death of animals when you pass through the tail because it has a cyanide molecule that can cause respiratory problems and or death. But that doesn't mean it comes anywhere near us or that this is, quote, a brown and red dwarf star or anything more than a comet. And it's a hyper-elliptical comet from deep space. So it's going to cause, when the sun grazes, some major superstorms in the sun where sunspot activity hasn't been this low for hundreds of years, but it could create superstorms. But how the heck are they going to know if it's Earth-directed? I mean, you know, Earth is like trying to hit a yeah. pinhead with a 22 caliber rifle 500 yards away. I mean, how is a CME going to strike or even glance the Earth when they have no idea the exact trajectory or whether this is an Earth-directed CME, even if the ISON comet creates one? This doesn't make sense, does it? Yeah. No, not at all. Not at all. And so uh, they are saying 100% certainty of a full-scale power outage. Well, the only way you can be 100% certain if you're planning on do it, doing it. Yeah, in other words, you've got your hand on the thing and you're waiting for a call from the White House to say, do it. Right. And, uh, but the issue is that there are hundreds and hundreds. I have never seen this level of activity of misinformation and using my name. I mean, it's just unbelievable. I mean, every comet that has come through the solar system, just about Comet McNaught, Comet Ellen, and the list goes on and on. Uh, people used my name, and it was, uh, you know, I had to put special postings on my webpage clarifying what I would say about each particular one. But th- this one is just beyond any out of control, uh, which tells me that. Uh, they're very worried about my message. They're very worried that when they take my writing, my transcribe what I'm saying, and then take a little smidgen of it and then clip a whole bunch of other thoughts to it that I never said, uh, yeah. like this one that, that says well, James McCain, this, this could only mean that it's Nibiru. No, that's not what it means. Right. And, and the other uh, thing is, you know, but, citizen astronomers can pick up uh, because there's so many of citizen observers, hundreds of times more likely than even these high-powered telescopes with electronic systems, the presence of comets and following and tracking them. And as a result, the NASA and the Tier 1 scientists can't control the flow of information from the public, so they want to disabuse your theory so people don't realize when they identify comets coming into the inner solar system, these things are dangerous. They cause plasma discharges between planets. It can cause gravitonic or action at a distance. It can trigger off earthquakes, volcanoes, and extreme weather. They can trigger gas transmission between planets, including, as you mentioned, from Jupiter. We know the tail of many comets contains uh, toxins that are actually lethal. Um, they're not just dirty snowballs. And this idea of a hyperelliptical comet being a sun grazer 700,000 kilometers over the sun in November, and they know the direct alignment in the exact days of the NERC trial is November 13th and 14th. This isn't by chance. So they're they're purposely disinfoing uh, Professor McCandy because they, if they killed you, they would prove that you're correct, and they would tell citizen uh, uh, astronomers with a backyard telescope, and I'm one, I have a backyard, you know, powerful telescope, they would um, tell the citizen uh, astronomers that, hey, um, if you listen to McCandy and you spot these comets coming in, look out, you can have a, little, a lot of trouble here on planet Earth. Uh, another thing we were talking about, Dr. Bill, is NASA has a panel of, of Tier 2 scientists to cover Comet ISON for the public. But they're going to start their presentations in November, a month and a half after it passes by Mars, which is a huge what? event. So why 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 would they yeah. do it after the fact? Do they they don't want people to know the effect of what it's going to do on the planet Mars. And they want to cover and control the information flow. Yeah, you can only exactly. conclusion you say is why would you a public panel after the fact? It's to spin it just like the CNN I call it garbage news network. Spin it. Maybe they know something we don't. <clears throat> well, Professor McCanny, um, 
You know, uh, there's a lot of disinfo ops out there that are kind of trying to say this is Planet X. Planet X is, is not a planet anyway. It would be a... Uh, the second star in the solar system is Jupiter. It actually generates certain parts of energy in the electromagnetic spectrum more than it receives from the, quote, the Sun, Sol, or Yellow Dwarf star. So the second star in our solar system is Jupiter. If we had a third star, it would be a brown or red dwarf, more likely a red dwarf, which are more common than the brown dwarfs. A red dwarf is 200 times the magnetic field of our sun, and if it would be coming in, its action at a distance magnetically would be enormous. It wouldn't necessarily have any orbital objects around it. It would be coming in a hyperelliptical orbit from deep space out beyond the Oort cloud, which is 0. 0.73 light years. Um, when the science that you put forward on this is pretty specific. If you have the proper data, you could apply your theory and explain exactly what's likely to happen if you had good orbital data and good trajectory data. Uh, you mentioned something on the break that I thought was a little shocking, that you couldn't find it when you looked up in the sky. You wonder if its orbital pattern or trajectory has changed because you couldn't see it. <clears throat> Secondly, you wonder why when you hear them actually blocking this information on some of these government websites, so you can't find the orbital or trajectory data. What do you think is going on? Yeah, and, and during the break here, I was trying to pull up the JPL, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, um, uh, orbital information for Comet Ison, and it's not there. Wow. I was uh, out you last wonder... night. My, I, I was out myself last night with my, I have some good binoculars that I use for comet watching, and uh, they're professional grade, uh, and I couldn't find Comet Ison where it's supposed to be. So I'm, I'm trying to figure out that either it's really, really small or it's moved uh, to, to a different orbit or uh, something. I don't know what's going on. And, and now I go to NASA's website that should be giving this information and it's not there. So uh, I, I'm just uh, at a loss as to... Uh, uh, what to think about this. Exactly, yeah. But, uh, uh, I'm, sure. I'm trying to pull this up right now as we're on, on the air here. But anyway, uh, there's so many aspects to this. Uh, Comet Elenin, for example, had a tremendous amount of misinformation associated with it. Uh, my name got tossed around a tremendous amount and now they're back at it again. It's very clear that the, the boys over at NASA really fear my message. And, uh, for, for, you know, they get to sit back and kind of coy, just do their little science like they're serious scientists. But they have this whole entourage of misinformation out there flooding the airwaves and causing misinformation, which is odd because if NASA is so wonderful, everybody should be going to them, not uh, rumor mill news or somebody's email. You know, if if NASA had credibility with the public, uh, no one would pay attention to any of this. But since NASA doesn't have any credibility with the public, people are actually paying attention to YouTube or uh, Wikipedia, other places that, uh, why would you go there when you have a national space agency that's supposed to be the top of the line scientists? Uh, it just shows that NASA has zero credibility. And uh, then I, I have my work, which is very plain and clear, and the statements that I make about comets, uh, for example, Comet Ison, I made a whole list of predictions including the November 10th to 13th dates with the electrical alignment with Mercury that starts its plunge into the sun. And so anyway, the NERC national power outage exercise is occurring on those dates. Yeah, that, that's not random. They didn't just pick that. And I, I looked at the pictures and read the bios of the people in charge of NERC. It's the North American Electrical Reliability Corporation, those guys didn't pick it. Somebody picked it for them. They're just the front people. Yeah, it really is disturbing to have, uh, and there's something coordinating this. That's why we see that, you know, when you have DHS and the former CIA director 
and you see even these disinfo ops, you don't know if they're people who are just kind of mentally ill out there or they're disinfo ops that are coming out of the woodwork uh, or, you know, God knows what. I mean, it, it, there, there's an orchestrated operational disinformation about the whole issue of comets. And we know since ancient times, if you look at ancient cartouches in Egypt, if you look at the ancient paintings from the Middle Ages, whenever people saw comets, there was common knowledge by astrologers. And, you know, remember now, all the astrophysicists in since the ancient times that watched the sky, all the people even from the time of Galileo that had lenses and could look with telescopes for the last 500 years, they all were fearful of comets. But you put together for the first time the theory that explained exactly why these are dangerous. You could also explain that much of the tail is actually not a debris from the comet itself generated, but actually from solar material that's present in the in space, uh, which is quite a bit different. It also tells you that the, that the operation of these things is there plasma objects that change the plasma physics of the solar system and can do a great deal of damage at action at a distance affecting weather, geotectonics, and uh, solar activity. <clears throat> it can even speed up things like thermonuclear reactions in all the planets that are nuclear, like Earth, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, that can cause heating in the, on those planets. It can have climate change. It can even have major effects it in the sun in terms of superstorms. Yeah, it, it can also, uh, it has the ability to build up chemicals uh, all the way up to the very long chain hydrocarbons, uh, including uh, it can build up relatively simple molecules like the nucleotides of uh, that are the basis for DNA. And DNA nucleotides have been discovered in comet tails. It's one of the things that have been confirmed. But I get a kick out of this, uh, along with the comet ISON misinformation. Uh, the other day, NASA releases a study and says life on Earth began on Mars. And it's like, what? <laughs> Where do they get this? And so they're saying that life could have traveled from Mars to Earth, and that's how life on Earth started. But, but wait a minute. How did it start on Mars? Where's the magic there? You know, they just set it one step away and then think that everybody, oh, well, it couldn't have started on Earth, but it started on Mars. Well, Mars is right now a dead, dry, lifeless planet. Well, it has also no magnetosphere. Monoxide. It has no yeah, magnetosphere, too, to create a magnetic field. Without a, without a magnetic sphere, you cannot have life on that planet. So even if there was survivable yeah. life, it would have to be very extreme. It would have to be extremophiles. Because of the uh, deep space effect and like a magnetosphere, it's exposed to cosmic background radiation, zeta particles and x-rays, etc. I mean, only extremophiles would survive in an, an environment like Mars. So if you don't have a, a, you know, a Schumann resonance magnetic field artificial magnetosphere generator, if you don't, you know, generate, uh, you know, a atmosphere and water, either chemically or bring it in there, how can you actually uh, geoengineer the planet to actually bio... Uh, Remediate it and turn it into a place where you know, could have trees and life and rivers and other things. It's a major job, and the yeah, problem is. is for them to make statements like that is uh, shows that they're trying to just kind of twist your mind to make you not understand things. Welcome back to the Nutramedical Report. Professor McKenney, and your latest programs on your own radio show, which, of course, is jmccsci.com, uh, jmcmckenneyscience.com, jmccsci.com, uh, and your reports, is the only place to get information about what you're saying. Uh, people misquote you. They talk about Planet X. They talk about all kinds of crazy things. And when we see the government involved in it, along with people who are out there just independently making misstatements, it's, it becomes very dangerous, especially when we have something that's hard science that could put the planet literally in danger, but there's no real preparation going on by government. I find it very just bizarre. We have this fear campaign. At the same time, they're talking about cybernetic attacks, which has nothing to do with the sun or solar or coronal mass ejections caused by an approaching comet, a hyperelliptical comet, on the one hand. And on the other hand, <clears throat> the government are very much behind this disinformation program, aren't they? Uh, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's very strange, the mixed information that's being given to the public and, and by agencies, you know, Homeland Security, the CIA, 
uh, agencies that are like think tanks, uh, scientists who whose job it is to advise the president on things like EMPs, for for them to come out with complete false information and present it to the public, uh, and then this is quoted by congressmen, congress congresswomen, and uh, then you have independent people like the head of Homeland Security coming out and saying we are absolutely going to have a power outage and a cyber attack. That was the strangest combination of events that I could imagine, that uh, we were both going to have a power outage and, and imminent were the words they used, 100% certain in our near future. So uh, just very, very strange. And then uh, with the amount of misinformation being thrown out there, um, it, it just is uh, extremely strange. Yeah, they, uh, they haven't revised their dirty. They haven't revised their dirty snowball theory. So unless they accept your theory and give you credit, and then if they give you credit, you'd also be, have predictive value. They'd interview you on their programs. They'd bring you into the tier one science. They'd publicly have open forums. They'd have you contacting and presenting to Congress and the Senate. Uh, what do you think of the? I don't see the the full report, but Mr. Kako talking about deep space and gamma ray bursts and so on. I mean. That doesn't happen very often, but <clears throat> there, do you see any evidence that there's a degradation of our solar system in terms of deep space and gamma bursts getting through the Earth? I mean, what's going on? Well, yeah, this is really strange. There's, there's two sides to this story. One is that uh, recently scientists, atmospheric scientists, finally admitted that they have no idea what causes lightning. And so they've done studies in clouds, and the, the standard story is that uh, two uh, air masses meet, cause thunderstorms, there's rolling, uh, uh, rising air causes a voltage, and that's what causes lightning. And then the thunder follows. And, and I've always said, well, wait, if, if you're causing electricity in the cloud, then it's going to discharge in the cloud. If you're creating a battery in a cloud, it's only going to discharge within the battery that's created. It's not going to come shooting out the ends, uh, right. going up and down. Well, but they've yeah. recently discovered cosmic rays, not only cosmic rays, but gamma ray bursts above thunderstorms. Now, imagine this. The nuclear bombs do not create gamma ray bursts. You get hard X-rays but you don't get gamma rays out of a nuclear explosion. So here we got your average thunderstorm, uh, Johnny Be Good thunderstorm rolling through your countryside uh, over your city, and there's gamma rays coming out the top of it. Now imagine this, a nuclear bomb would not create that. And scientists are scratching their head, and so now they've decided to study this. So gamma rays have two aspects. Another study came out and said, well, we need, we can say that gamma ray bursts cause the lightning to, to, to ignite because they don't know what causes it to ignite. Well, how can you ignite lightning if you don't have enough power in the cloud to, to sustain lightning in the first place? Well, the first strike apparently is not even from between the cloud. It's actually the initial strike is from the ground to the clouds, isn't it? Right, but but how does this happen when I mean their theories are so bone stupid, yet they're trying to patch them up and put band aids on them? You see what I'm saying? Right. Uh, they they first so admit what, what, there's what, not what, enough energy in the there's not enough so, energy in the cloud to create lightning, and then they're going well it's the gamma rays that cause the lightning, and like you say the the lightning doesn't even come from the cloud it comes out of the ground. And, and then you've got gamma rays going on above. You've got elves and sprites and, and high-energy X-rays uh, coming above the cloud. Well, the only way you can do this if this is part of a bigger electrical circuit. And the, the cloud just happens to be the medium to transmit this current down t to uh, Earth. Right. And In other so words, you're talking about the Earth, which is a, yeah, the Earth is a nuclear reactor with a crust on it. And so what you're saying, there's a passage of plasma energy from inside the Earth, which is a nuclear reactor, to a larger system, which is a solar system that's a plasma reactor. 
So the gamma ray bursts are actually not caused in the cloud. They're actually discharged from the planet to the, the plasma intermediates, like the clouds, uh, and, and to a larger system. Is that, is that what you're saying? Well, the, the, no, I'm not, I'm not talking about the core of the Earth. I'm just saying that the solar electric field I mean, between the solar, uh, the solar electric field. In other words, just, from the planet to the solar electric field, the gamma ray bursts are just created by that process, and the clouds are not are only a me, an intermediate, is what you're saying. Exactly. And let's take the backyard bug killer. It's an example I use a lot in the explaining this. Uh, you have a couple of uh, high voltage, you have a high voltage pair of grids. The outside is ground and the inside is, you know, a couple thousand volts. Well, what happens? The bug flies between the grids. He brings in his ground potential and he gets in there and zap. The discharge goes right where the bug is. It, it never goes anyplace else. It's right where the bug is. So the cloud is like the bug. It's, it's because the cloud is there, it's where the discharge goes. And, and it's part of an overall much larger discharge. Now, this is not that extremely difficult to understand, and it's not so difficult to understand that the cloud can't create lightning, and if it did, it wouldn't come shooting out the top and bottom. Uh, it would discharge within the cloud itself. Uh, I was at a American Geophysical Union one time, and I had a group of graduate students around me, and I had on my poster a picture of a volcano uh, the, uh, in Chile. I forget the name of it, but um, big, massive volcanic plume coming out of this volcano, and it was at night. But beautiful, beautiful arcing electric uh, lightning coming off of the plume and off to the mountains, off to the side and down to the, to the uh, mountaintops. And I said, this is part of a bigger electrical discharge the reason you know that is because the electricity is coming out of the plume. And all of a sudden, one of their professors came up and got really angry. And he said, the lightning is created in the plume by the uprushing of gases, and that's where the electricity is created. And I said, well, how come it comes shooting out of the plume? It's a very basic physics concept. And all in one, this one woman, graduate student, turned to me and said, yeah, it's coming out of the plume. It can't be generated in the plume because it would discharge in the plume. And he got so angry at her, he said, it's generated in the plume, and that's the way it is. And the graduate students were just, like, in shock. Well, but yes, the thing is, is that the, example. They're, they're closing ranks, is what they're doing. And it doesn't matter which country you yeah. go to, you have the same kind of foolishness going on. Uh, and when an earthquake does this, and the other thing is people have to understand that earthquakes and volcanoes are plasma events, aren't they? Absolutely, yeah. They're yeah. very much connected with the, uh, uh, with that, the atmosphere. Right. And that's why when you have the, you know, the movements of highs and lows, the weather system, jet stream, etc., are all connected. back and Professor McCanny, um these are important issues uh, you know the fact is that we can predict earthquakes we know that there's a major increase in earthquakes in Fukushima Daiichi 500 percent since the March 11 2011 uh, superquake an upthrust that caused the Fukushima disaster <clears throat> triple meltdown we know earthquakes and volcanoes are increasing all over the planet these are actions at a distance that are basically plasma events. We know that when earthquakes happen, there's a discharge of plasma along the fault lines. That's how geotectonic weapons work, by inducing energy through the planet itself that hit the piezoelectric slip, slip threshold where the induced energy builds up energy in the, piezo, in the crystals and they eventually reach a giant wave status where the mu or resistance drops in the, in the uh, faces of the rocks so they jump until the energy is dissipated. If they jump six inches, say in California, you get a level nine earthquake. <clears throat> Although there's 11, inch, 11 feet of recoil already stored up in the rocks, the lens, San Andreas. We've got uh, volcanoes all over the planet. When the ones go off and you have plasma discharges, just like the uh, movement of weather systems, which move the ionosphere and the, and the jet stream, uh, earthquakes and volcanoes are plasma events. And that's why comets are such a big deal, because they're a major plasma disruptor of the solar uh, plasmatic field and these chemical and these chemical and radiological and uh, plasma 
uh, effects on the planet are pretty dramatic, aren't they? Um, so I think that part of the reason is Tier 1 science knows that you're telling the truth, and they don't want your theories to receive support because the citizens will get freaked out by what they see coming because they know these could be uh, you know, extinction-level events where the government purposely is doing nothing. The biggest reason I finally figured out exactly why they're so worried about comets and the reason they're worried is because if people in mass woke up and found out that uh, what was going on and historically that had changed the course of human history, people would be living their lives very differently. And they, the people in control would lose power because right. the people would immediately know that those, the leaders, the bankers, the, you know, why would you pay your interest on your house? Or pay your insurance payment when it doesn't have it doesn't matter because there are bigger fish to fry on the planet in the solar system. So they want to keep this everybody glued to the evening news. Oh, the stock market. Oh, the the downturn in the economy. Will Obama be able to uh, turn around the economy? Oh, we're on the upswing now. You know, just baloney. They 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 have people convinced that uh, they well, should work they were, a 40-hour-a-week job and pay interest on an overpriced house and buy a car on credit, then they, that's a good life, you know. <laughs> well, what they're doing so is trying to keep the, they're trying to keep the, I call the farm of planet Earth, and each state, each country on Earth is like I call the farm of the United States of America, the farm of Ecuador, the farm of Canada, and uh, we're uh, being uh, farmed to death. And they treat us like cattle. They don't want to expose us to tier one science. Our educational institutions don't want us to, like that grad student asking questions that a so-called professor got ticked off at. They don't want us to ask questions that says, hey, you know, if you become aware of these things, you realize that there's periodic and, and, and repetitive cyclical extinction level events that can cause a catastrophe in society. But for example, we know that there's a major increase in solar activity outputting more UV B, C, and D light, that's an actual fact. Um, Dane Wigington has been tracking the fact that geoengineering in the upper atmosphere has been put up there with nanoparticles. I actually took care of pilots flying out of Buckley and Peterson who told me straight up exactly what they're doing. And Dr. Isley, physicist uh, and founder of the World Constitution Parliament Association of the United Nations, spent an entire evening explaining in great detail after I told him I was one of the doctors for the pilots. So I know in exquisite scientific detail exactly what these maniacs are doing. And then we add to it the damage caused by Fukushima Daiichi that's chewing up the ozone layer at an enormous rate. If we have a nuclear war on top of that, it's going to chew it up even faster, and we have UV shock to the benthic layer of the oceans, and the death of the remaining trees caused by UV shock, which they're now dying because of the increased in UV, B, C, and D light. On top of that, we have um, a financial system that's teetering on disaster, and the government is pushing for more and more control. Uh, more and more control, more on biometrics, more biometric IDs. They're getting ready for a totalitarian state that makes 1984 and Brave New World like a garden party. And people just don't believe us. They think that we're mentally ill because we raise these questions and we show the evidence that it's already happening, not maybe going to happen, and that there's already UV changes occurring, that we're already having geotectonic and action at a distance, earthquakes and volcanoes. And extreme weather, that's why we have typhoons that just struck uh, Mexico, killed 38 people, a lot of other people. A major typhoon struck Japan, and uh, they dumped a 1,000 tons of radioactive, highly radioactive water in the Pacific Ocean. Duh, we're in a lot of trouble. And uh, the news team out there is trying to kind of massage your brain. Don't worry, little citizen of Earth. Everything will be fine. we got your mass grave ready for you. Shocking, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah, they're, yeah. They're, I, I think that the world is going to be in for a shock here very shortly. And, yeah, and, uh, and, and, and but, but what, what do you, how do you frame that shock? You shock in terms of the revelation your science was correct and that we are in danger of a, a CME induced event, or do you think the government will take, however the event is, even if it's minor, they're going to amplify it and spin it so that they can create the maximum disaster effect to get whatever agenda they want? What do you think of, of those possibilities they're going to do? That's, because it seems to me like they're going to take an event of no matter what the extent is and amplify it to, I call it the FEMA, the Federal Emergency Magnification Agency, and they're going to magnify the crisis so that they can bring a totalitarian global world state. 
Exactly. Yep. And uh, I've always said that the power outage is the method that they're going to use because it's right. so 100% complete. Uh, if right. you look at other methods, like you say a bio attack or a false flag, or the Arabs did it, uh, bio attack right. or even a nuclear attack uh, from a from a dirty bomb, uh, an EMP from a rocket from Korea. Look at any of those scenarios, and they don't really hold a candle to pulling the plug on the power grid. And that's why when Napolitano said uh, we're going to have this. Uh, basically, it, it's to put them in control. Right. It's to put uh, them in the driver's seat. Yeah. Uh, October nineteenth. Yeah, yeah. We had the uh, the, the September eleventh disaster in two thousand one. In March, I met with the FBI and CDC director because it was uh, the appointment under Reserve Admiral John Hughes with Rocky Mountain Occupational Medicine in Denver on our war game simulation. Uh, using a supercomputer up at the uh, NOAA uh, in Boulder, Colorado, and also a simulation on 17th Avenue and at the Performing Arts Center in terms of bioweapons release. And we did get war game simulations with hazmat officers, federal uh, uh, FBI and CDC officers, <clears throat> and we proved that we killed everybody. We basically showed we were completely incompetent, that everybody would be exposed, would be dead, and that whatever pathogens, if it could be spread, would spread. And, of course, the government uh, wants to know these things. They insert them into their supercomputer so they can predictively model it. But you don't see any real action going on. We don't have a system for sentinel offices to pick up viruses as they come in. We don't have a process for HEPA filters on aircraft with a chain of custody to send off to a CDC-certified lab to tech. Phone calls to people after they land in America, after they come in an international flight, if they're healthy in the next two to eight or ten days. We don't do anything. And I presented this six months before 9-11, and they told me there was going to be a, a, a war game simulation in New York City, and there were going to be micro-nukes, biological weapons, and anthrax release. They told me all this stuff. And I was just shocked. I said, do you mean you're going to let this happen, or you're going to cause it? And they all of a sudden got silent, and you see both of them, their faces turn white as a ghost. Both the FBI and mm -hmm. CDC director. And I confronted the FEMA director right in, in our Adams Mark Hotel back in, in, uh, in March of 2001, uh, on the podium with all the military officers around me and all the other hazmat people. And I told them, I said, the very first thing, seeing this classified manual, is that you're going to pull the plug on the power if there's any kind of disaster, including EMP uh, or any other kind of so-called terrorism. Your plan, the very first thing you're going to do is shut down the Internet, shut down public communications, and shut off the power grid, period. doesn't matter if people crash on the freeways. doesn't matter if people can't get their food or gasoline. You're going to shut down the grid. And he tried to walk off the podium, and I chased him out of, this, out of the room, firing questions at him. And we see now more evidence. They're at the same damn game. This is back in 2001, March. And now these idiots, 12 years and a half later, they're now trying to do another false flag around Comet Ison and more. Amazing, isn't it? My rage index on a scale of 1 to 10 is like 25. I'm pretty ticked. I want people to know they're only going to hear the full truth here on this program with Professor McKenney. Listen to his show at jmccsci.com. Go only to his website for the truth in this information, not the wackies that are out there making all kinds of spin arguments or the disinfo ops or even NASA, space weather, and national government websites. Thank you, Professor McKenney. Back tomorrow, Harvey Schlanger and Theodore Shabbat will...